And welcome back to the Region of 120. I'm Jeff Clint, and this is a series of videos of 120 things that I learned as a student at the University of Regina uh, in Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about analogies, uh, and specifically reasoning by analogy. Uh, and so the, the basic idea of an analogy is you have two similar things, or two similar objects, or two similar processes, and they're similar in some aspects or respects, and you're, you want to know something about one of them, and you know something about the other, and you basically try to assume, or, or you, you try to reason that because they are similar in some respects, that they are also similar in other respects as well. And so the thing that you're trying to find out, uh, you will reason by analogy, follows along the thing that you know things about. So, and if you, uh, for example, have uh, two things that are alike in many, many ways, uh, and you don't know if, if the thing that you're trying to find out, uh, what one way or another, which, which way it is, uh, you can reason because the, the, the original two things are too similar, or are so similar, that it is more likely than not that the the property or the thing that you're trying to figure out uh, should also be similar as well. This is not a full proof, uh, you know, absolutely concrete way of reasoning. Uh, it is mostly just a guideline or a way of, of coming to conclusions uh, in the absence of other data, in the absence of other means of doing so. Uh, it's something that we, we tend to do in, in conversations automatically. Uh, you know, the, the use of the term like, you know, you, follow along that, you know, this is like, uh, you know, the, uh, sorry, lost the train of thought, but it, again, it's, it's like a train of thought, uh, the, the process of thinking, they're similar enough, or, or, or rather, it's, it's similar enough to a train that you can reason about uh, how it moves, that it's similar enough that you can make conclusions based on it, uh, and when, you know, the train stops, it's, it's close enough to a real train in that sense, at least, that you understand what I'm talking about. But again, it's, it's not a, a foolproof uh, way of reasoning. It's entirely possible that the, the property that you're trying to explain or describe isn't actually the same as the thing that you're drawing the analogy from, but it's at least something that you can test or usually get closer to testing. It's something that you can get closer to actually getting data from. Uh, it's something to narrow the amount of possible conclusions to the ones that you may want to actually focus on. Um, so there's that. The other uh, thing worth pointing out is it's a good idea if you're going to be reasoning by analogy to try to reason by analogy from many different directions or from many different uh, similar objects. So if you have only two things to compare, you know, that's all you can do, well that's great, but it would be better if, if you had multiple different things to compare the thing you're trying to learn about in order to, to see whether the properties that you're trying to measure, the properties that you're trying to learn about, measure up the same in each case. Um, so, you know, quantity is good, but quality is even better. If you can restrict the ways in which the similarities are, are present, or the, 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 if you can restrict your focus to only the ways in which things are similar, to the things that are, you know, very constant, uh, if you can get to the point where you're, you're dealing with uh, the the physical laws involved and, and the, the ways that things are invariant or the ways that things uh, are related to each other in a fundamental way, that is better than just in a contingent way or a way where the, you know could or in a way that could be different uh, from case to case to case. If you can reframe your problem into another area and solve it in that area, that is kind of the goal so that you want to have control over the way you, you know, think of or frame what you're trying to solve or the, the problem you're having in a way that's beneficial to you. You want to take the battle from a place where you're uncomfortable with. You know, if you, if you, you know, are, don't consider yourself good with math, if you can get it as far away from math as possible, if you can get it into the things that you're used to thinking about and then solve the problem and then see if you can backtrack and go all the way back the original problem and make your solution known there. You know that that is the, the goal here. Or that is the the, 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 the tool, the, the reasoning aid that we're trying to, to get at here. So 
you know, you, there everyone's good at some things. You know, if you, you know, don't think that you're good at something, you're you're almost positive that you're there's something out there that you know you're a human being. You have descended from you know billions of years of evolution. Something about the way that you think, something about the way that you do things, is probably you know more than you know good enough to, to reason from. Uh, you know, you want to get to that careful or get to that spot where you're comfortable. Get to the things that you're good at and reason by analogy. Get to the, you know, if, if you're good at chess, rephrase your problem in terms of a chess problem. If you're good at geometry, rephrase your problem in terms of a geometry geometry problem. If you're good at art, rephrase your problem in terms of physical, or in, in terms of logical objects that can be drawn and see if you can make the problem exist in the space that you're comfortable with about thinking. So, and then that kind of suggests the, the, the next kind of question, which is, uh, so there, there's going to be different levels of, of preciseness and uh, kind of the, th there's a mathematical way of, of viewing analogy and then there's the kinds of analogies you'll make in day-to-day -day conversation. How are they different? And there, there's generally about a, a very limited set of ways that they're different. Uh, and specifically on the mathematical analogy side, uh, you want to look for when there's two sets of or two collections or two kinds of objects. In this case, we'll call them S and S prime. And if there's a relation, or and, and you know that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the two members of, of these two sets, or the two members of these collections, of the two kinds of objects. So there's, for example, one such one-to-one -one relation might just be a number. You know, if there's three of them here and there's three of them there, you know, there's this relationship where there's one of these S's for every S prime. It, th that's not the only kind of one-to-one -one relationship, but it's certainly one of the easy ones to know about. Numbers is, is you know, you, you can count things. You can, uh, you can do sim similar things to counting. You can uh, look at the way that things are related in order to generate relationships or number of relationships. But the important part here is that there's this one-to-one -one relationship between the object S and the object S prime, or the, or the kinds of objects. If you can get to this one-to-one -one relationship part, uh, then other relationships between different kinds of S will have corresponding relationships that you can draw analogy to in the S prime, uh, I guess, other kind of objects. So the, the goal here is that even if these re relations are not 100% uh, you know, provably there, uh, it's at least a suggestive thing that if there's a relationship here, there should also be one here. Uh, you know, that there's a should in that sentence, so it doesn't have to be the case, but you, you can at least look for it uh, and draw conclusions based on whether it is there or whether it could be there. Another uh, thing that will make uh, analogies more precise is if there are, again, as mentioned before, kind of laws between uh, the, the separate parts. So this is kind of looking at it from the other way. So if you know something about the ways in which different types of S's correspond to each other. So for example, if there's an inverse square law at play, so there's something where the, the relationship between two objects, maybe they move uh, in, in one over r squared. This is very common in physics, or there's the forces involved are, are, are one over r squared or, or one over something squared. You, if you can know that about the first kind of object, you can usually get to something that says something very similar about the second kind of object, uh, and if you can, again, show that they're related. Um, the third way that you can get to uh, a, a precise uh, and meaningful uh, analogy is if it's not one-to-one, -one, but a many-to-one relationship. So if there's a controlled or a known way that you have a many-to-one relationship, you can also draw conclusions in a mathematically precise way. The conclusions will be different from those you could draw from a two sets or two collections with a one-to-one -one relationship, but there's going to be a kind of conclusion that you can draw, and that kind of conclusion is going to be something that you're going to be able to systematically draw uh, from. It. So, kind of just reviewing, we, we 
you know, we, we've, we've talked about uh, both the, the benefits of using analogy, some of the ways that you can very specifically use analogy uh, and, and, and kind of watch to see if you're going off track. What's an example of you know, an analogy or a situation where you'd actually need one or where it'd come in handy? If your question is to find the center of gravity of a 1D4 dice, that the, the, the material of the dice is the same no matter where you are in the dice. Uh, if you don't know the answer to this question, you may be kind of stumped up as far as how to find it. But you may recall that if, if you have a rectangle, that the center of gravity for, or, or at least the center point uh, for, if, if you look at, say, a rod, it's going to look like a rectangle if you look at it from the side. And if, the, if you know that the center of gravity for a rod is in its middle, um, or at least the middle between the, uh, the, at least the rectangle when viewed from its side, you can get to the point where you have a whole bunch of rectangles stacked to the point where it looks kind of like a triangle. Uh, you can notice that the middle points of these uh, rectangles uh, will line up so that you have at the po where the point of the triangle is, you have kind of a, a, a segment or a, a line that's being or I, 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 that comprises of these kind of middle points of these middle points of these line or segments. So if you can imagine that the more of these segments you put on top of each other, and the, the specifically the, the more of them that, uh, or as you shrink them, so that the closer you get to an actual triangle, the closer that this line becomes to an actual line uh, of all the middle points of those, those particular segments. So you could reason that if this was a triangle, the center of gravity would be at least on this line. But of course, triangles have three sides. So you could flip this and do the same thing on each side. So if the center of gravity has to be in this line for this triangle, uh, and it has to be for all three sides, then you could reason that the place where these three lines intersect is going to be the center of gravity for this triangle. Now, this is something that we're, you know, you, you haven't really got to the point where you're using much of an analogy yet. And this is where we're going to take the, the step of using the analogy and where you're going to be, I guess, the, there's going to be benefit from doing so, which is that if the place where you're finding the center of gravity for a triangle uh, is going to be at the middle point where these three lines intersect, then it stands by an analogy with a triangle that a 1d4 or a tetrahedron, uh, its center of gravity will be between the, I guess, points and the base of each side, uh, the, the lines extending as much, uh, where those three intersect should be where the, the center of gravity is. This turns out to be the case, but if you didn't know this, you could get there from here if you assume that the, the triangles are similar in a way, if they're related in a way, you don't even have to know that this is true for certain, but at least it gives you a, a, a way of addressing this problem, getting to 
the point where you can, you know, double check that this is actually the case. It gives you a point, a point that you can start with, a point that you can look at, you can confirm, a way of dealing with these, you know, problems that, um, you know, might otherwise seem intractable. Uh, and they, they do so in a way that's kind of appealing to human reasoning and the way that we think about problems. This is similar to this in a way that we can appreciate, we can understand. Um, so, again, ho hopefully this example is uh, kind of followed through clearly enough. But, uh, you know, if, if there's other examples you would like, uh, feel free to request them. This video is for your benefit. So, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? No questions? And uh, again, uh, hopefully you enjoy. So see you next video.